The fire department of New York is one of the biggest and busiest fire departments in the world. They pride themselves on how they tackle fires and rescue people, whatever the cost. New York City Fire Department is, is a very aggressive fire department. We, we attack the fires from the inside. We don't break a window and stick a hose line in there from the street and put water on the fire. Because if you do that, you're pushing the fire throughout the rest of the building. You aggressively go into the seat of the fire and push the fire out the building. But to do that, you got to be in the building. We're able to, to cut a path through the fire, um, rescue the person, and, and get them out. The skyscraper city of New York presents exceptional challenges. And while firemen risk their lives together, they also work, sleep, cook, and eat together. When you walk into a firehouse, I was reborn again because I felt the electric going through me, how everybody works together, how we go shopping together, we go clean the truck together, and then we're down the hall where we put our life on the line. You were going into life and death situations with them, and you depended on them, and they depended on you. The firefighters form a vast but intimate clan, often passing from father to son down the generations. John Vigiano Sr. is one of the most decorated and respected firefighters alive. When he got throat cancer, his son, John Jr., gave up his dreams of becoming a high-flying businessman. He saw the Brotherhood in the fire department. He saw how men gave their time every day to take care of my wife and I. He gave all those dreams of his away to become a firefighter. Just, I want to be like you. Wow. His other son, Joe, became a highly decorated policeman. On 9-11, both brothers, one policeman, one fireman, would each rush to the towers. By chance that day, Chief Pfeiffer was being followed by a film crew. The morning of 9-11, we were having breakfast in the firehouse, and uh, we got a run for a gas leak. Um, the fire trucks went out, lights and sirens, and we went to uh, Church Street and, and Lisbonard um, and for a gas leak in the street. Then at 8.46 in the morning, we heard this loud roar of a plane. Uh, we saw it pass by us to the west and then dip behind the buildings. Um, when it came out, I saw the plane aim and crash into the North Tower of the World Trade Center. And, and we knew at that moment we were going to the uh, biggest fire of our lives. Chief Pfeiffer calls in the first alarm, and within minutes, as the scale of the devastation becomes clear, the alarm starts to ripple out across the whole of New York. Over the next hour, over a third of all the fire crews in New York would descend on the Twin Towers. Engine 1-0, World Trade Center, 1060. Send every available ambulance, everything you've got to the World Trade Center now. American Airlines Flight 11 is flown into floors 93 to 99 of the North Tower, instantaneously killing everyone on board and many office workers on those floors. The impact slices through the three stairways, leaving them blocked by rubble and fire. 10,000 gallons of jet fuel ignite and course down the elevator shafts, blasting nearly all of them out of action. It's estimated that there are over 14,000 people in the buildings. Marvin Pickram originally trained with the elite Navy SEALs, but is now working as a trader on the 85th floor, just eight stories below where the plane hits. The fire was filling up the the hallway and I I went into a panic um, you know just I remember feeling the, the intensity of the of the flames and I just was trying to get as far away from the fire as possible so I ran to the other end of the hallway um, I kind of felt like a, a mouse in a trap he manages to find his way to the stairs 
and along with thousands of others, begins a long descent. The alarm comes at a moment when the fire crews are changing shifts. Many firefighters who should be going off duty stay on and rush to the towers, deciding they cannot leave their brothers. Among those to respond is the crew of Engine 216, based in Brooklyn, including Tony Sansevero with his best friend, Danny Sewer. I was flying through the skinny streets, and I remember we're popping mirrors off of cars, like bing, 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 bing. And the one thing I remember now, at this point, we get jammed up, boom, the door flies open, Danny's off the rig, you know, he's like running down the street, like throwing, like literally moving car, get over, get over. Now he's running ahead of the rig. He's just getting us through traffic, and I'm telling you, we squeeze through that. Engine 216 take huge pride in their speed and aggression when attacking fires. This is nothing new or unique. This is part of the tradition and history of the fire department of New York, dating back to the days when the firemen formed roving, brawling gangs who fought fires and anyone else who stood in their way. The aggressive tactics that you see at any fire in New York can be traced all the way back to the gangs of New York, to, to the 1840s, to the 1850s, where these volunteer fire companies risked their lives to rescue their neighbors. And that's where it begins. And the training and the tactics and the courage all flow from those days. These early gangs raced to fires to earn the honor of being the first ones to put them out. That tradition still continues today. I remember being in Manhattan and it was a uh, apartments and we used to race the other company up the stairs. They take one stairway, we take the other and it was a race. Who was gonna come out first and uh, that's part of the company, you know? But on 9-11, these traditions lead to both tragedy and heroism on an unparalleled new scale. I knew we weren't putting that out. I was like, we can't put that out. And my first words were, uh, holy shit, we're gonna die. Just four minutes after the plane hits, Chief Pfeiffer arrives at the North Tower lobby and sets up his command post. His role is to marshal the firefighters that will soon come flooding in. The fire is too big and too high to put out. Their mission is to find and evacuate the civilians. But with the lifts out of action, reaching the impact zone would take nearly two hours of relentless climbing. As the firefighters came into the building, they had this, this look on their face of concern. It wasn't panic, um, it was a, a quiet, looked that this was going to be a tough job. Um, and one of the lieutenants that came in, uh, I can remember coming up to me um, with that same look of concern um, and wondering if, if we're going to be okay. I, uh, I, I told this lieutenant that I, I wanted him to go up to the 70th floor and to take his firefighters with them to evacuate and to rescue stood for a second and we looked at each other, wondering if everything's going to be okay. Um, and then he turned around and, and took his, his men upstairs. And that was the last time I saw my brother, Kevin. The firefighters are already facing the biggest emergency of their lives. Then a second plane is spotted. Out of the corner of my eye, I catch a plane coming down the Hudson River. And I keep an eye on the plane, and I watch it circle around the Statue of Liberty. And I watch it drive right into that South Tower. fires in the two impact zones 
are burning as hot as industrial furnaces, forcing some stranded people to jump. Down below, the firefighters still pour in. Their first casualty will come in the most tragic and unexpected way. Fire crews from across New York are converging on the World Trade Center. They are facing the largest rescue mission in American history. But first, they have to get into the towers. They arrive at a scene of devastation. Remains of passengers and office workers have been blasted blocks away. It's sheer hell, you know, there's just bodies, body parts. It's not bodies, there's just pieces, like hands. Um, you know, I saw it, I remember seeing a hand with a ring on it and, you know, luggage and big, big piece of metal. As I went up West Street, there was body parts everywhere. And I remember, um, I was the only vehicle on the road. And I remember trying to, um, drive around them. And it became impossible. I, I said, please forgive me. And I drove over some. It was my only way to respond. And I remember just saying to Dan, you know, what do you think, you know? And he's like, this is gonna be the worst day of our lives. That's not what you want to hear from Danny, sir. And I just remember thinking to myself, like, oh, you know, we're not turning around. Danny's not gonna, you know, we're not stopping and running, which I didn't want to do, but every inch of your body is telling you to do it. You know, like, man. The fire department set up a series of command posts and staging areas to control the flow of firefighters into the building. Each unit is held in place till it's dispatched to a particular floor or roll. It was pretty hectic. It was pretty hectic. The guy running the command post would turn around and say, I need two engines, and the, the next two up would go. And that was weird, looking at the faces of the guys. You know, because as they were crossing the street, that was a little bit uh, unusual, because they just had that uh, distant look, and some of them had that distant look in their eyes. They said, OK, we're going in. The plan is to reach the impact zone and try to cut a path through the fires to allow trapped civilians to escape. The same aggressive tactics that have been used for over 150 years. As hundreds of civilians pour out, Battalion Chief Orio Palmer leads the charge into the South Tower. He's an avid marathon runner who also trained as a lift technician. He manages to repair one of the lifts and gets it up to the 40th floor but he still faces over 30 floors of relentless climbing. I can't explain it. If he was around, you knew the situation was gonna be in control. And I just thought that, not that he was above, you know, being hurt or, or above being killed. I guess I had a lot of faith in him. We're gonna have to listen. I'm on 69 now, but we need a higher price, baby. Following behind are the five rescue companies of New York. These are the elite units of the fire department, men with extra training, skills, or experience. They come in from all five boroughs of New York. Rushing in from the Bronx is Rescue 3. Among them is Tommy Foley. His brother Danny is also a firefighter and is now with Rescue 3. This is the first time he has ever spoken on camera. He was someone I looked up to, you know, my whole life. We got along great. We were best friends. The best years of my life. So. Tommy Foley was one of the most promising young firefighters in New York. He'd made a name for himself and his unit with a string of high-profile, daring rescues. He loved rodeo riding and had been named by People magazine as one of America's 100 most eligible bachelors. On 9-11, he's making his way up the South Tower. I just have in my mind that he was, he was helping people. He was talking positively to people. Uh, he was probably smiling and saying, you know, it's going to be okay. Um, 
you know, we'll be okay. We'll, you know, you'll get down and, and it'll be fine. Fueled by the desire to rescue lives, some firemen don't even check in with the command posts. The chiefs struggle to keep track of their own men. Other crews come without even being called. We responded and then we got the run as we were responding, which many companies did. And some companies responded and they never got the official notification. But we responded just because we knew we were going to be needed. Now my son has my genes. I drove a fire truck. I put myself in that seat and I would have said to the captain, Cap, we're going to sit here all day waiting for these idiots. We know where they have to go. Say the word. Both John's sons are now in the towers. Police detective Joe in the North Tower and fireman John in the South Tower. Marvin Pickram is in the North Tower. As he makes it down past the 50th floor, he starts to see the first firefighters coming up. Those guys were angels that day. And they just came in and they're just doing their job. I mean, we're, we don't know what's going on. And they're just, bam, coming through, you know? And that's making sure that we were on our way to safety, doing what they could, heading up the tower as it's burning to try to help people get out. And I just amazing respect for those guys. Oreo Palmer and one colleague reached the impact zone in the South Tower. I don't think that he or any of them thought that building was going to collapse. Was that close? I saw in the pocket for fire. We should be able to knock it down with two lines. Where are you? Where are you? Where are you? Where are you? 78th floor. And it's no more than 45 cold horns. 478. Ah. That's all. We're almost the same. We're going to get two engines up here. Ah. All right, that's all. We're on our way. Just minutes after this transmission, the unimaginable happens. The South Tower, the second tower to be struck, is the first to collapse, just 56 minutes after the plane hit it. speed and scale of the collapse is totally unprecedented and unpredicted. The firefighting command posts stationed around the towers have to flee for their lives throwing the rescue operation into further confusion. Not a single person inside the South Tower survives. Most of the stories from that tower will never be known. Among the dead are Oreo Palmer and Tommy Foley cloud of concrete, dust and glass crashes into the North Tower and engulfs the lobby where Chief Pfeiffer is running a command post. We didn't know a 110-story building was collapsing. We thought that part of the plane fell off the, the upper floors and was crashing into the lobby, or maybe the elevators blew out. Higher up in the North Tower, the stream of hundreds of exhausted firefighters know even less about what's going on. Captain Greg Hansen, then a lieutenant, is on the 35th floor of the North Tower. It felt almost like an earthquake, but it um, turns out the South Tower is now collapsing. Right? We don't know this, though. We have no idea. So we kind of have in these blank stares looking at each other like, what's going on? 
The North Tower is now a ticking time bomb on the brink of collapse, which most of the firefighters are utterly unaware of. There is one vital piece of information that the police have that could give the firefighters precious extra minutes to escape. But an ancient rivalry between New York's bravest and New York's finest will lead to unexpected consequences. In New York, the firefighters have a long tradition of friendly but sometimes bitter rivalry with the police, dating back to when lawless young men had first formed gangs to fight fires over 150 years ago. This rivalry has simmered on ever since. Before 9-11, there were several instances where the elite units of the fire department who respond to car accidents and other kinds of emergencies uh, showed up at the scene of an emergency and the police department's elite units also showed up and there were several instances of brawls. You'd be on one side, the cops would be on the other side and it was just this, like you could hear the verbal jabs going back and forth. I think it's a combination of ego and pride. In 1993, the World Trade Center had been rocked by a terrorist bomb. People had been airlifted off the roof by police helicopters. Some fire chiefs had thought that reckless and pointless, a police publicity stunt. As a result, the doors to the roof had been locked ever since. On 9-11, the smoke was probably far too thick to land a helicopter on the roof. But this rivalry would have other far more terrible consequences. A police helicopter has a bird's eye view of the collapse of the South Tower, but many of the firefighters in the remaining tower have no idea what has just happened. Uh, what other agency knew, knew, what many people watching TV knew, was that a whole building uh, collapsed to the ground. We were never given that information. Worse still, the circling police helicopter then calls into question the condition of the North Tower and radios this warning to the police. The firefighters have separate command posts and use a different radio system, so don't hear this. This lack of communication means that many firefighters have no idea how urgent the situation now is. But surrounded by choking dust and debris, Chief Pfeiffer knows he has to take action. So I got on the radio and I said, command to all units in Tower 1, evacuate the building and the firefighters started to come down. Um, the only thing is we made a unhurried retreat. I heard, mayday, mayday, get out of the building, get out of the building. Now this, you know, you normally hear this for a low level building, one or two stories where you can get out, you know, within seconds. We're on a 35th floor of a high rise building. To make matters even worse, the radios that the firefighters are using don't work properly in skyscrapers. So some hear the mayday, but many others don't. I guess with the information of having the May Day, you know, I had this heightened sense of urgency that, you know, we can't be stopping for anything. You know, so we, you know, we have to get out of this building as quickly as possible. As Greg Hansen leads his engine company down, he finds an exhausted man who can no longer walk. Despite their hurry to get out, the team stop to help him. He says, you know, grab his legs. He says, we got his arms. He says, let's just, let's just drag him down the staircase. And, um, you know, we gave him a bumpy ride down that staircase. Louis Caccioli is on the 23rd floor. All of a sudden, I found a bunch of people. I don't know where they came from. They were yelling, screaming, okay? Commotion, panic. So I grabbed them. I said, let's go, buddy. We're going out. Everybody, I led the way. We were going down the stairs. We get down to the bottom of the stairs of the North Tower. We go, I go to open the door, okay? The door won't open. I start pulling on the door, and people are panicking behind me. There was a couple of tough looking guys. One guy was holding the hand, and a little bit at a time, we wedged the door, but like this. Now I see out in the lobby, there's light. We, we have hope here, because there's light. Louis ushers the group of civilians out of the tower. Having made it down more than 80 stories, Marvin is now lost and confused in the smoke, just four floors from safety. 
I saw a fireman through the smoke, and I remember seeing the silhouette of the fireman. I remember seeing his silhouette, and he had the little light. And that's what I used to kind of figure out where I needed to go. I'm not an overly religious guy, but, um, you know, that was an image of an angel for me. The fireman points to Marvin's escape route, and he, like thousands of others, gets out because of the firefighters who came in. I survived because they were there. That's how I feel. Bill Spade has stayed in the lobby, guiding people safely out of the North Tower and away from the... As soon as, you know, they gave the okay and we got out of the building, I'm like, okay, you know, we made it. The driver of engine 47 is looking for Louis. All of a sudden, I hear, I hear a voice go, Louis, Louis. I turn around, it's my chauffeur, Lance. He can shout school to me, where you been? We're looking for you, we're calling you. And we're hugging, we're like, we're hugging each other like this. And we're feeling so good, we're like, I'm, I'm crying, he's crying. And all of a sudden, all of a sudden we hear, look out, look out, look out. The North Tower that I just came out of maybe two minutes ago, starts coming down. I look back there and I see the antenna coming down and I said, oh my God. The building just liquefied up there. It just, it just disintegrated. Within a second, it just went black. You felt like this wind hitting at your back. And then you just felt, you know, this pounding of rocks. That's what it felt like. It felt like somebody, you know, just was like a machine gun of rocks being thrown at you. I threw myself on the floor. This, this is the first time now. This is the first time that I feel like this is it. I'm, I, I'm dying. The air is full of choking concrete dust and ground glass, making it almost impossible to breathe. I see my wife passing in front of me, my kids passing in front of me. I said, I can't believe this. I made it out of this tower, and I'm going to die in the street here. The next thing I know, I put my hand on, it was a mask. And I said, oh, please, God. I open up the mask, and I hear it up. Yeah, shh. Threw the mask on like this. I never even put it on. I just threw it to my face like this, and I was dragging it and dragging it. The next thing I knew, I had paramedic working on me. Bill manages to crawl out of the rubble through the thick cloud of dust and debris and is taken to a nearby hospital. And my brother-in-law calls me. He tells me all the guys are missing. I said, what do you mean all the guys? And he said, all the guys from five. I started naming every guy I had breakfast with. They said, Bill, all the guys. There was 12 of us that responded. I was the only one to make it back. The site of the World Trade Center is a vast field of compressed concrete and twisted steel sliced through with hidden crevasses. Among the hundreds of firefighters still flooding in is Danny Foley looking for his brother, Tommy. I said, Dad, I have to be honest with you, it's not good down here. He said, okay. I said, Dad, I can promise you one thing. I said, we will find them.
So we will find him. I'm not coming home until we, we do. 343 firemen died on 9-11. The firefighters become heroes, but for many, their battle was just beginning. And they would soon discover that the adulation came with a price. After the Twin Towers fell, the hunt for survivors went into overdrive. Underground fires burnt, hot enough to melt the shoes of the rescue workers scrabbling over the surface. This was all that remained of two of the world's tallest buildings. Danny Foley began the search for his brother, Tommy. The first 36 hours, we had never left. And I just remember saying to myself, well, if there is a small little void that he can fit in, he'll be in that spot. If there's somebody that can survive this, it'll be Tommy. By the night of the 12th of September, 18 survivors were found. They would be the last. So 10 days later, September 21st, Friday evening, we found Tommy's body. And uh, brought him home. We're very lucky that we found him. We're very, very lucky because a lot of families don't have that, and we do. And we have him back and um, where he should be. After three weeks, the last lingering hopes of finding survivors faded, and Debbie Palmer had to break the news to her three young children. My youngest one, I remember, I felt like she cried because that was the thing to do. What's the matter? I got down on my knees and went eye level with her, and I just said, Dad is not coming home. And she just looked at me like I slapped her. And she said, uh, he's not. And her knees buckled out from underneath her. And she just like fell onto the, onto the rug. So like that is something I'll, I'll never, you know, get out of my mind. As the weeks turned into months, John Vigiano maintained his constant vigil alongside a group of fathers who had all lost sons in the Twin Towers, what became known as the Band of Dads. He had to wait before his son, police detective Joe Vigiano, was found. And they said, do you want to see him? I said, no. I saw others. I didn't want to see my son. Not that way. The search carried on for nearly nine months, and John watched and waited till the bitter end. No trace was ever found of around half of all those killed that day, including John's other son, firefighter John Vigiano Jr. The images of the dignified funerals and the firefighters working every day on Ground Zero were seized on by a public and a press desperate for some kind of hope. The firefighters were hailed as the heroes of 9-11. They courageously charged into the towers to rescue people and 343 had made the ultimate sacrifice. After 9-11, firefighters and police officers, we were like, God, everybody looked up to us. Like, you know, we were the best. I don't like to be called a hero, okay? I did my job, and I did my job the best I could. 
Many of the men who had been labeled heroes were struggling to hold their lives together after the trauma of 9-11 and then working on Ground Zero. Each had to face their own demons. I was out of control, out of control. And I'd see it, I saw it after because I, I, I wasn't sleeping. I was, I, I, I was, I, I, had, I had rage, okay, I had road rage. I got involved with the, the confrontation. I, you know, I was just a bitter guy. It wasn't Louis. It wasn't Louis no more. Certain images and things that just keep playing back in your mind, uh, such as you know, watching people jump, watching that gentleman in his brown suit, um, and what was left of him you know, after he landed. The dreams, the flashbacks, the, the collapse, waking up in cold sweats. As the years passed, 9-11 would also have a profound impact on the culture of the firefighters. Before 9-11, if you would have told, asked me, you got to go for counseling, I would have told you, you got a better chance of hitting lotto, okay? Because it's, our job is like, you know, you don't show. But you know what? After 9-11, I'm a big supporter of a counselor. I feel like it saved my life. The brotherhood, that bond that defines what it is to be a fireman, amplified their suffering and sense of loss on 9-11. But for many, the horror and loss inflicted that day also sealed the bond and made it stronger than ever. We call uh, where we work a, a firehouse. It's a home. It's a place where you, you eat and live together and, and work. Uh, in the days after 9-11, we came back to the firehouse and we had to mourn um, the people we lost that day. Um, but it was the firehouse that was the family that was starting to heal each other. And it flows over to everything that we do besides work. It flows over to what we do together as families with our wives and children. Um, all of our wives know each other, our children know each other and play together at parties. Pain, yeah. Good days, bad days. But. We have a life to live. We have friends. I have five grandchildren. They come to my house. Do they want to see an old man sitting in a dark room crying? No. The unique character and history of the fire department of New York meant that around one in eight of all those killed on 9-11 were firefighters who rushed into the towers. But their actions also saved countless lives. The terrorists wanted to kill as many as they can. They did. And when everybody else is running, running out, we're still responding in. And that'll always be the tradition of the fire department.